Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed. Oh, when he washed. When Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed. Oh, when he washed. Yes, when he washed. He washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. He taught me how to watch, to fight and pray, fight and pray, and live rejoicing every day, every day, oh happy day. Oh happy, oh, happy day, when Jesus washed, oh, when he washed, he came into my life, and he washed my sins away, and it was a happy day, he taught me how. To watch and fight and pray, fight and pray, and live rejoicing every day of my life, every day. Oh, happy day! Oh, happy day! Oh happy, day. oh happy day! Oh happy day! Oh happy day! Yeah, when I get to the kingdom, it's gonna be a happy day. They tell me the streets are made of gold. They say that I will never get old. When I see Yeshua, it's going to be a happy day. I'm going to tell my Savior. I'm going to tell him that I love him. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, when Jesus washed. Yes, when he was, he came into my life, and he washed my sins away, washed them all away, and it was a happy day, oh, happy day, my happy day, oh, happy day, my happy day, oh, happy day. Thank you for making that a happy song. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you might have. I really enjoyed the Being Far From The Shore song. What's the name of that song? What was the first word? Drifting. Drifting far away from, that was beautiful. And boy, didn't Elias sound great? Harmonizing like that? That was beautiful. And who was that on the drums? Who was the drummer boy? <laughs> yeah. And of course, James, you know I miss singing with you, right, brother? You know that. That's right. OK, 
Okay. The guys, there were these two men, right? And each of them needed to build a house. Now, one guy liked to take shortcuts. He always wanted to do things the easy way. D because deep down, he was a lazy man. Working hard was as foreign to him as walking on air is to an elephant. So <laughs> he, found, he found the easiest place he could, uh, he could upon which to start building. When you know it, it was sand. That's right, sand. Because it was easy to access and it was easy to dig his foundation. Sand made his job so easy, in fact, it took him only a few weeks to complete the house. He was so proud of himself. And boy, it looked beautiful. Well constructed, too. Man, how easy it was to build this house, he thought to himself. Later, he would find out how easy it would be for it to fall down. As time passed, a huge storm broke upon the house of this man, and there was wind and much rain. Then a flood swept through the valley, and the man's house that was built on sand was swept away. It was gone. Gone with the wind. The title of my sermon today is just that. Gone with the wind. Now I'm sure you recognize my little story. I may have embellished it a little. But it's taken from the parable Christ told in Matthew 7. Let's go look at that. Matthew 7. And we'll read about this foolish man. Okay, Matthew 7, and I will pick it up in verse 24 and read through 27. The Lord, our Savior, Yeshua Messiah, said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. But the star of our show today is this person who heard the sayings of our Lord and did not do them. So he was likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. The second man was foolish, and he found out the hard, hard way just how foolish he was. He chose to build on sandy soil where it was easy to access and easy to dig the foundation. But unfortunately, it was also easy to fall apart. You know, it sounds very foolish, doesn't it? Sure it does, yet... You know what, there are people today who are still building their houses on sand. Literally now. They're what my grandmother calls hard-headed. Good sense can't penetrate their thick skulls. And they build on sand in abundance too, in direct violation of Yeshua's warnings. It's like they're thumbing their nose at Christ and saying, well, we don't give a hoot about your dumb warnings. Delaware and Maryland on the shores of the East Coast are two examples of states that are doing this. Now the islands there are just about all what you would call barrier islands. You see, uh, the beach is not often where the mainland reaches the ocean. The beach, if it is of sand, here in Delaware and Maryland, is often what they call a barrier island. Let me tell you what a barrier island is. Is it's nothing more than a sandbar with a body of water behind it called a bay and the ocean in front of it. These are called barrier islands and they can be as wide as a mile or two and as narrow as a few hundred feet in places. Whole cities and resorts have sprung up in recent decades on these barrier islands. Now there's one Barry Island in particular called Ocean City, Maryland, which is really a city with condo buildings as high as 25 stories, right along the edge of the water. Now, it is the nature of these barrier islands to shift 
and shape differently over the decades and the centuries. They are dynamic systems interacting with the sea currents and wave actions which form, deform, and reform them. They are powerfully affected by hurricanes, and you've all heard of the nor'easters that roll along the east coast. Even beaches directly connected to the mainland shift and shape differently over the years, so you can just imagine how a barrier island can be affected. And these barrier islands are becoming much wider. How? Well, one of them, in fact, extends almost 300 feet out from the boardwalk. Lots of expensive equipment is up at the north end of the beach, continuing what is called a beach replenishment project. What they do is they pump sand, sand, not dirt, sand, from way out in the sea, about a mile away, up onto the beach to make the barrier islands larger. Now the cost for the, it's called the Bethany Beach, one of them is called the Bethany Beach area it's about five miles in length and is over five over five hundred five million dollars uh, has been spent over three years to build this Bethany area Bethany Beach area and you know where most of the money comes from the federal government now I'm not sure what this whole Delaware Coast project costs but it must be hundreds of millions of dollars now let me ask is this an appropriate way to use federal money? I don't think so. Is it even an appropriate use of state money? Frankly, that's really none of my business. I mean, if a state on the East Coast wants to build a home or business out on sandbar, fine. But should the federal government be asked to pay for this foolishness? That's your money and mine. Now these beachfront towns and cities are little economic engines. And where there is an economic engine, there's a tax base. So you hear politicians say things like, oh, well, you have to spend money to make money. So to them, these beachfront properties are worth protecting and restoring to the tune of many millions of dollars each decade. Now, any owner of beachfront property is, by definition, a wealthy person. No poor person can afford beachfront property, right? It's just not possible to buy near the shore and not be prepared and able to spend lots of money. So it just seems that if someone wants to build their house on a sandbar, we shouldn't be asked to help foot their expenses. If they want to replenish the beach as the ocean erodes their property, as oceans have always done in the waxing and waning of the beachfront, then let them pay for it. Perhaps beachfront owners and all who build homes and businesses and those who patronize those businesses could contribute to a common fund. Let's call it the Fool's Fund in honor of the biblical text. <laughs> in the end, the federal government should not be asked to pay lots of money to protect the property of people who are already quite wealthy. And before we too quickly ask the poor and the more urgently needful to take a hit as we supposedly balance the federal budget, maybe it's time to look at why we're spending huge amounts to protect properties where we shouldn't be building anyway. Sandbars and barrier islands naturally shift about, eroding here and growing there. So maybe all the federal government should do is just post a sign there that says, build at your own risk. Ooh, it's kind of warm up here. <laughs> Somehow in the last hundred years in America, we have gotten into this bad and expensive habit of building cities and communities too big to fail on sandbars and on land far too close to the ocean. Now you can be foolish for only so long and then your foolishness catches up with you. This parable although true in the literal sense, has a spiritual meaning. And it's that spiritual meaning that Christ was really getting at. Okay? The house in this parable is a picture of life. That is, the man, that foolish man, built his life based on how he interpreted the message of Christ. 
Now, he probably believed the message, but only to a certain point. He applied the words of Christ to his life as he saw fit. This foolish man is like the person who hears Yeshua's words, but does not put them into practice. The storm symbolizes the pressures of life, like sickness, failures, losses, temptations, etc. The true nature of a Christian is revealed in moments of crisis like these. They show what manner of person we are. When the trials of this life come, the foundation of one's life will be uncovered. It's like that part of the parable in Matthew 13 that deals with the seed that is received in stony places. Let's go to Matthew 13 and, and look at that particular part of the parable. I think it's a great parallel to this story about the foolish man. Matthew 13, and I'll read verses 20 and 21. Oh, thank you, Brother Cornell. What'd you say? You got me back. Okay, uh, verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and soon with joy he receives it. Yet hath he not root in himself. Because the way that Christ told the parable, the, the sower threw the seed in the stony places where there wasn't a lot of dirt. So the, the seed quickly took root with the dirt it could find. And he wasn't able to really take, build a strong root system. Anyway, verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself, but he endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. Just like this foolish man. When the trials of life came upon him, his house was gone with the wind. The stony place represents the stubbornness of the person to fully commit to God's will. He knows what God's will is, but he wants to continue to do things his way. And he uses a little tribulation as an excuse to go back to the world. The foolish man who builds on the sand is the person who only thinks about the here and the now. He has no vision concerning the future. He simply wants to build his house quickly and enjoy it right away. Now what happens today is all that matters to him. And if he wants to build in a short time, why waste the energy and pay the cost of building a house on a solid foundation? Why would, um, just build it any way you want. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> just build it on the sand. But what is going to happen if there's a storm? Well, the foolish man obviously didn't think about that. And if he did think about it, he probably said to himself, oh, that's not going to happen. That was his foolishness. He knows that he should build his house on a rock. He heard God's word, but he deliberately ignored the instructions and the warnings because he didn't believe the warnings were warranted. This idea of believing things won't happen Reminds me um, of a scripture in Second Peter 3 of people who said the return of Christ won't happen. Second Peter 3. Second Peter 3 verse 3 saying, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. And saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So they, they don't believe that he's coming. So that gives them license to continue to do what they want to do. Boy, would they be surprised when their houses fall. This foolish man, instead of believing the gospel and coming to faith in Christ, believed he could build his life on the shifting sands of human philosophy, wisdom, opinion, and religious achievement. He was driven by outward religious appearances and faith in himself rather than faith in the Lord. People who build on the sand hear the gospel but choose to save themselves 
without success. They hear the gospel and believe its general message, but they choose to follow God on their own terms. To them, his word is open to interpretation. If he commands them to do something, they'll obey if they choose to. But if they don't like it, they won't do it. They build the house of their lives on self-will, self-fulfillment, self-sufficiency, self-satisfaction, and self-righteousness. Theirs is a works-based religion that has the appearance of being right, but it lacks the power to save them. Paul describes a kind of person like this. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, he says, turn away. That's in 2 Timothy 3, 5. Now people build on the sand because it's easy. It requires little effort. A little change here, a little change there. And they can fool themselves and everyone around them into thinking that they are right with the Lord. A life built on the sand requires no commitment, no sacrifice, and no faith. They don't want to do the work that's required because they're spiritually lazy. Like mentally lazy people who want someone to think for them. That's why we're in the political mess we're in now because people would rather have others do their thinking for them. But they're finding out that no one who does your thinking for you has your best interest at heart. It is their own interest they're looking out for. If they really had your interest at heart, they'd tell you to think for yourself. And you know, Satan looks for spiritually lazy people, doesn't he? They are easy prey for him. And people who build on the sand have been deceived by him. He has deluded them into believing they can pray a prayer. Sign a card or a check. Join a church and everything is going to be okay. They can turn it on and off like flipping a switch. They can be in today and out tomorrow and in again the next day. They come to church on the Sabbath and do what they want to do from Sunday to Friday. Sand builders ultimately have their faith in themselves. You know, when God makes demands on sand builders and calls for, for total, total surrender to his will, they make excuses. I mean, Christ encountered this very thing when he was here on earth doing his ministry. Let's turn to Luke 9. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, Luke 9, I'll start at verse 57. Luke 9 verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Christ said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. Now before I move on, let me just tell you, now there's a reason why this scripture is here. I'm pretty sure that's there because that man didn't follow Christ after he heard that. Christ, he said he didn't have a home, nowhere to lay his head. That man did not want to live a life like that. That was a, the demand that was going to be on that man if he followed Christ. He'd be like a homeless person. And I don't think we ever heard from that man again. <laughs> Verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But the man said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Christ said, let the dead bury the dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. I don't think he did that. Because he really wanted to go bury his father. Of course, that's a spiritual meaning here. Uh, let the dead bury the dead. Let spiritually dead people bury spiritually dead people. But this man wasn't that willing to leave the world. And so I'm pretty sure he did not because we don't hear about him again, do we? Just like that first guy. So the demand on this man to leave the world to its own didn't register with him. And another also said, Lord, I'm going to follow you. 
But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Christ said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I would dare say that this man uh, never put his hand to the plow because he was looking back already. He wanted to go back home. He told God he was going to follow him, but he wanted to go take care of some business first. God said, no, you're going to follow me. Start right now. I don't think he's ever started. There was another one where God told a man, Christ told a man, um, okay, if you want to follow me, take all your riches and give them to the poor. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. And what does it say? That man was sad because he had a lot of money. So we know he did not what? Give his money to the poor. He did not follow Christ. So when we hear what it's like to follow Christ, most people are going to make excuses not to follow him. It sounds, oh, it's too difficult to do that. Give away all my money? You mean I can't go bury my father? Things like that will, excuse me, will keep people from following Christ. Because they still have their minds on the world. So people who build their lives on religion, self-righteousness, and false hope are not really serving God. They're serving their own self-interest. They're not sacrificing. They're only walking the easy path. And you know that easy path is that wide path to destruction. That's the easy path. Sand builders like instant results, instant rewards, instant satisfaction, and instant pleasure. They are shallow people who love the heights but hate the depths. They are hot and then cold. They're in and then out. They're up and then down. The warning in this parable is this, guys. As important as hearing the word of God is, the saint should not fool himself into believing that hearing good sermons or attending Bible classes is all by itself the whole doing of the will of the Father. God's will is that his word be heard in such a way that it be done. Doesn't the Lord's Prayer say, thy will be done? Yes. His word should so penetrate our ears that it digs down to the rock-solid foundation of our lives, reaching the deepest parts of our heart and subverting it to his will. Now, the wise man in our parable was the one who built his house upon a rock, right? He's like the person who not only hears the word of Christ, but he puts them into practice. Therefore, the difference between the two men is like the difference between the foundations of their homes, their houses. The difference between obedience and disobedience. And that is the main factor that determines whether a man is wise or foolish. Outwardly, these two persons look quite similar. There's no big difference in the kind of house they're building. Perhaps they use the same kind of material to build their homes. Both homes seem nice and attractive outside. Inside, it was probably cozy and warm. But the fundamental difference between them was the foundation on which they built their houses. However, you can't see the foundation because it's hidden. Now, what that means is both house builders are professing Christians, both of them. They're familiar with the Bible. They both regularly hear the teachings of Christ. When you look at them in church, you really can't tell the difference. They talk like Christians. They behave like Christians. And they do all the Christian things. In some sense, they are building their lives on the teaching of Christ. At least they appear to be. The warning in Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23 is connected with the warning in verses 24 through 27 by the word therefore. Let's go back to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, and I will read this time 21 through 23. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
but he that do, does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name we've cast out devils? And in your name done many wonderful works? <coughs> but then, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And the next word is therefore. <laughs> that connects these two pass passages. Now the two positions in the first passage. The one I just read. Can be compared to the two house builders. In the next passage. There are people who call Christ Lord. That will not enter the kingdom. There are people who build their house on the sand. And their house will not stand when a storm comes. See the similarity? On the other hand, there are people who call Christ Lord and they will enter his kingdom. And there are people who build their house on a rock and their house will stand firm when a storm comes. If you really want to get deep with this, that storm could also represent the return of Christ. His second coming can definitely be compared to a terrible storm. The parable tells us that the rains came, the floods followed, and the winds of destruction blew. That, that's what's going to happen in the second coming. Pretty much something like that. This image is not necessarily just about some storm in life. This can also be the image of judgment. In the end, both houses were subjected to a terrible storm of judgment. One house stood, the other was totally destroyed. The house that was built on the sand couldn't face the withering judgment of God. And it collapsed. Yeshua said, and great was the fall of it. That means that the house was utterly destroyed. There was nothing left to show for the life lived within it. There was nothing left of hopes, dreams, plans, efforts, works, or anything. Everything was destroyed and swept away as if it had never existed. All was gone with the wind. So this can be a picture of what will happen to every person who builds their life on anything but Yeshua and the gospel. There is a coming day of judgment. There is coming a day when every person will face God. People who are trusting in religion, good works, some prayer they prayed, some emotional experience they had, some profession they made, or anything else will see the house they built crumble and fall before the judgment of God. So it's important to understand, my brothers and sisters, that the contrast in this parable of the two foundations is not between, between a Christian and a non-Christian, but between professing Christians whose house is built on sand and professing Christians whose house is built upon a rock. Both come to church they listen to the same Christian messages. They read their Bibles. You can't tell the difference between them. Because the deep foundations of their lives are hidden. The real issue to consider here is not whether they hear the truth and understand it. But whether they do what they hear. That will determine their destiny for eternity. The difference will be revealed only when a storm comes. The house built on the rock will stand firm. But the house built on the sand will be gone with the wind. It will be destroyed. That house will fall flat and great will be the fall of it. What about our lives? When Satan brings temptations and trials to us, it may feel like we're being battered by a flood. In fact, the Bible refers to the enemy coming in like a flood. In Isaiah 59, 19. Let me read that verse to you. Isaiah 59, 19. 
says. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. And when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The enemy coming in like a flood. If we have our faith built on the, the Lord, we will be able to stand firm against that enemy. And perhaps you found yourself standing on sand before. And when the flood of temptation or trial came, you fell flat, just like that foolish man's house. Well, I, I, I just don't want you to be discouraged. You know, just pick yourself up, repent, and choose to be like the wise man. It's still not too late. The wise man listened to what Christ told him in the Bible and did what he said. And if you do the same thing, you will find yourself and your life back on solid ground. And you know what? When we listen and obey Christ, what rock are we building our lives on? Let Psalms 18.2. Let Psalms 18.2 tell us. <laughs> Psalms 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. That's not only there either. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. The Lord is our rock. So when we're building our lives on the Lord, man, we're building our lives on a solid rock. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Yeshua, the Messiah. <coughs> Christ is our rock. He's a firm foundation that we can build our lives upon. And if we obey him and everything he tells us in his word, the Bible, we have the assurance that no matter how strongly the flood beats upon us, no matter how fierce the storms and winds of this life may get, we're not going to fall. We'll never be moved. Christ is our rock <laughs> and he is the foolish man's storm. No life can be founded upon Yeshua's teaching unless it is also founded upon faith and trust in Yeshua. Now, you know what? To find this faith, we have to dig deep. Just like you have to build a good foundation, you have to dig deep. This notion of digging through topsoil before laying a foundation on a rock appears in a parallel passage of the Gospel of Luke. And this is a little detail that I think is important. So it's worthwhile for us to read Luke's account of Yeshua's parable. Let's go to Luke 6. And I want you to ob uh, observe especially the actions of the builders in Luke 6. Luke 6. And I will begin verse 46. And this is all going to be sounding familiar because it's the same passage that's in Matthew but with a little extra added to it Luke 6 verse 46 and why come you me Lord Lord and do not the things which I say whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them I will show you to whom he is like he is like a man which built a house and he dig deep and he laid the foundation on a rock and when the flood rose the stream beat vehemently upon that house and couldn't shake it for it was founded on a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. But let's go back. Let's back up to the wise man. Did you notice what the wise man did? He was looking for rock on which he was going to build his house. And it says in verse 48, he digged deep. <laughs> he, 
he had to spend a lot of energy digging. So he dug and he dug until one day he hit rock. Now at first, he cleared a little patch on the rock that he saw. He saw a little bit of rock. But that wasn't enough. So he continued digging around. And again, he dug and he dug. And gradually, he saw more and more of the rock. And he continued to dig and dig until he could start building his house on that rock. You get the picture? Yes. The action of digging down simply means us showing a determination to do whatever Christ tells us to do, no matter what the world and Satan are trying to get us to do. An important spiritual principle emerges here, and it is this. It is in doing his will and his will alone that you will be able to know him and to make contact with him. The rock. And think about this parable again. Before you can reach the rock, there's dirt <laughs> and mud to dig through, right? The dirt and mud represent the material world and even our own hearts that separates us from Christ. And even if you are willing to build on a rock, you don't make instant contact with that rock. You have to take the time to dig deep to get to that rock. Now, both men wanted to build their house, their life. Both were willing to listen to the word of God, but only one was willing to do what God said to do. The other one didn't want to do it. He wanted to continue doing his own thing. One was willing to dig, and the other one didn't want to dig. So the principle is this. Those who are willing to dig through that muck and mud to do God's will, to carry out the teaching of our Lord, those are the people who are going to make contact with the Lord. But think of the man who's digging down. How does he know there's rock underneath there, all that mud and dirt? In those days, they didn't have electronic devices to rely on like we do. <laughs> they just didn't know how long it would take before they could find rock. Well, in a sense, the dig digging itself is an act of faith. You dig with the confidence that you will find rock underneath that soil. That you will make contact with the Lord. So you work your way through the muck, the gunk, and the dirt that is your life. And that is this world and your heart with the confidence that the Lord is going to be there. And when you make contact, he's going to clean you of your deepest, darkest, dirtiest sins. And then set you apart from this dirty world. Paul uses a term that magnificently describes the doing of God's will by faith. He calls it the obedience of faith. And you know, it, we can find it in both the beginning and the end of the book of Romans. So look at Romans 1 and verse 5. Romans 1, 5. Where it says, By whom we have received grace, and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Obedience to the faith. And then in chapter 16, in the, at the end of the book, Romans 16, the first chapter and the last chapter, verse 26 says, But now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So for Paul, there's no way to separate faith from obedience. There's no true faith without obedience. And we've talked about this many, many times. We know that we are saved by grace through our faith. But that faith will not save us if it is not the kind of faith that finds expression in practical daily obedience to God. The letter of James tells us that an intellectual faith can never save sinners. Because that's a faith without works. He says only a faith that is expressed by our works can save us. 
And that is why James urges us not just to be hearers of the word, but also doers of God's commandment. James 1.25 echoes the teaching of Christ. And the wise man is the one who hears Yeshua's words and acts upon them. You know, Yeshua also speaks about this obedience of faith, but he says it in a different way. It means the same thing, but he says it differently. Look at John 14, 21. John 14, 21, it says, He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So, not only do you believe in his commandments, but you also keep them. He says he will reveal himself to those who obey him and keep his commandments. That's how you obey him. That's the obedience of faith that I'm talking about. And it, it is through this obedience of faith that Christ will manifest himself to us. Verse 23, Yeshua answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So if you're saying you love Christ, you're saying, oh yeah, I believe in Christ. But it's more to it. You also have to obey him. Keep his words. So Yeshua is going to live with us and fellowship with us all the time. He's going to make his home with those who keep his word. And so it is through the obedience of faith that we have a living contact with our Lord, Yeshua Messiah. Okay, let's look at a couple more scriptures. Matthew 21. Let's go back to Matthew 21. Matthew, I mean. And then this time, chapter 21. Matthew 21, and I will begin in verse 28. Yeshua says, But what think you? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. I'm not going to do it. But afterward he repented and he went and did it. And he came to the second son and said the same thing. Go into my vineyard and work. And he answered and said, yeah, okay, dad, I'm going to do it. But he didn't go. I ask you, which of those two did the will of his father? They say unto him, why, the first one, of course. But Christ said unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Because these Pharisees, they claim they was uh, doing God's word, but they really weren't. So you see how important it is to do God's will? Even if you say you're not going to do it at first, but you repent and do it, you're better off than the one who uses his mouth to say he's going to do it, but doesn't do it. Christians who maintain this obedience of faith can express their faith with assurance. True biblical assurance comes from doing God's will. The man or woman who says, Lord, whatever you say, I will do, and does it, walks with conviction with the Lord. The spiritual world is as real to him as the material world. And Paul came to know God in a very special way. He said this in Acts 26, 19, our last scripture. Acts 26, 19. Let's read what Paul says about how real the spiritual world was to him. Acts 26, verse 19 says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Yeshua was so real to Paul that he could not disobey his commands. And he should be just as real to us. Let's don't make the same mistake as that foolish man made. He built his house on the sand because he believed that the storm would never come. But the floods did come and so did the winds. And his house was swept away. He was swept away. So the choice is left before us. Are we going to follow Yeshua and do what he calls us to do? Or are we going to follow our own way? It's either go with God or be gone with the wind. <laughs> if we really perceive what's at stake here, that is our destiny for eternity, the choice shouldn't be difficult to make. Have a good day.